Okay. Um, I guess it's time. Let's get started now. Um, so we're working on the problems on uh, basically arithmetic this week. And uh, I think the problems are interesting, um, maybe a little bit. We'll see if they're harder or not than the other ones. How many people have got all four of the problems done? Okay, a couple of people got all four of the problems done. How many people got three of the problems done? Okay, how many people got two of the problems done? Not. You're three? Okay, you got one, you just got one solved? Okay. Um, how many people got two of the problems solved? How many people got one of the problems solved? Okay, good. How many people got none of the problems solved? Okay, so um, so this is good. Let's go through this and see how you did it. That's more than um, than I would have actually expected, perhaps, at this time. But some people, I gather, have done some of these in the past. And some may not be as complicated if you do them in the right way, as might have been seen. Okay, so the first problem was this one on primary arithmetic. Okay, no, it was reverse and add. So who, who did this problem? Okay, I'll say you. What, what, what's our, uh, tell us about the problem. Um, what do you do? You start with an integer and you try to get a palindrome. So you just continually reverse the number and add it to itself. Right. Until you end up with a palindrome. Okay, and uh, can you, okay, so the question is you start with a number, you reverse it and add it, and you keep going. And um, if you, you stop when you get a palindrome. And um, I guess the question is, how do you know you'll ever stop? Uh, they tell you you will. They tell you you will. Um, what if they gave you 196? Then you wouldn't. Then you wouldn't. But they tell you that everything, all the, all the things they're going to give you are going to finish in less than 1,000 iterations. Okay, so that's a good thing to do. So basically you're saying that uh, either you should explicitly, oh, I see, everybody will end. So you're saying you don't even have to explicitly test if it's going to end. Okay? How many people got this one? Okay? How did you do it? Let's think about this. Okay? What was, what was the, first of all, how many lines long was your solution? Let's try it this way. Uh, like 40. 40 lines long. Okay? How did you do it in 40 lines? Okay, so, so you did that add, but how did you do the long ar arbitrary precision add in 40 lines? Was that actually an easy thing to do? Uh, I didn't work that first, and I just changed everything to longs, and then I just worked. I didn't do anything. Of course, the memory is no larger than the long integers. What? Oh, I see. Okay, so one thing that's interesting is you're telling us that the palindromes will not be longer than that. That's actually the interesting thing. So if we go ahead and do that, then um, what you're saying is it will, we will never have to use anything greater than a, this would be millions, this would be billions. This says, I guess, what, an unsigned, unsigned integer should do it, or a long, long would do it, right? So, okay, so let's think about that. Is that whatever, how many people actually explicitly wrote long, in, long addi uh, uh, addition? Did anybody write long precision arithmetic for this? Precision. Long precision arithmetic. So you did. How long was your solution? 50 lines. 50 lines, okay. And you implemented the, arith the addition actually on a ba you know, basic digit by digit basis. Yes. You did, you basically just took the number, you had a reverse function, and a palindrome function, detect function, and an add function. And the add was done basically by the system. Is that right? Okay. Let's go through that just to double check. How did you do the reverse? Um, I so if you have now in, in one integer, if it was a, a string of digits, it was easy to see how you would do the reverse, right? Yeah. How did you do the reverse in the absence of a string of digits? Okay, so you had, I see you had an old number and a new number, right? Yeah. And at each loop, I shifted the new number to the left one. 
That's so by multiple, you said mu equals mu times 10. Because that will now create another digit. Then what did you do? Then I added uh, num mod 10. The old one mod 10. Yeah. Right? And then you. And then I did uh, old div 10. Old div 10 to remove that digit. Did yeah. everybody see that? That's actually a pretty neat and slick way to do that. Okay? There probably are more painful ways to do that. But that seems like the right way to do that. Okay? And that will give you how to reverse a number. And um, how to test if it's a palindrome? Just check if reverse and like just call reverse is the same. Once you have once you have the reverse function, then basically take the number in and reverse, and that that I believe. Okay. Any questions? Anybody else do anything on this one that they felt reasonably clever? Okay. Any questions or any ideas? What? Maybe maybe. Uh, Okay, so what you're saying is um, that when you're adding a number to its reverse, your claim is that if you did, so, so let's say we have the number 3, 2, 1, and we add it to 1, 2, 3, this is going to form a palindrome. And the way that you would tell that is that there was no carry operation done. Okay? Now, it should be clear, I believe that if you do a reverse and there is no carry operation, it won't produce a palindrome. Okay? Why is it? First of all, why does this make any sense that a number should, when you reverse it and add it, realize a palindrome? The important point is that the first, when you make a, rever a, a number and reverse it, here you've got the first digit, here you've got the first digit, here you've got the last digit, here you've got the last digit. Okay? In principle, the sums of these should be the same of those if there is no carry. Does everybody agree with that? So if there is no carry, it is a palindrome. How can you argue, though, to me that there's necessarily that, that, that it could not be a palindrome if there is a carry? Is the other part of that statement true? Well, uh, it's like if here you've got a carry in the offset symmetric side, you've got a carry. You've got two ones shift over. It's not clear to me. What happens if the carry happens here? Maybe I, I, okay. Again, you may, there's a chance you're right, so I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure I'm right. But I want This is actually an interesting thing to work out. The thing that I'd be concerned with is if there is a carry from, let's say, the first place, it's going to change the number of digits. And now the question of what this aligns with, okay, is going to be different than it was before, okay. So this is something I'm concerned with. Do you, did you believe that if there's no carry, it can't be a palindrome? Or you're not sure? I'm not sure, I'm just... Okay. Uh, no, uh, if you... Uh, 56 and... Uh, 6... Uh, uh, 506 and 506 and 605. 5006 and 6005. That would come out to be 11... Zero, zero, 11. no, zero, 11. Does everybody agree with that? So that's a counterexample to your claim. Is that right? Very good. How did you come up with that so quickly, out of curiosity? That's, I'm that impressed with that you came up with that example. I, I, I just tried um, 56 plus uh, six, uh, 65. Okay. Anyway, it, that's impressive. But so, so the argument is that the reason why this property, let's say, so when, there are a lot of problems about integers. We take a number theory class. We learned about number theory. Integers have all kinds of amazing properties. Then if you talk to people who are, you know, recreational number theorists, they'll, they'll come up with all kinds of weird properties of integers that aren't really that interesting, but hold for some number of examples. And I think the palindrome property is probably one of those. Okay? 
it logically will hold, it will hold if there is no carrot. Now, why would we expect that there's always going to be a place where there's going to be a carry? We probably don't expect it, and we probably don't know, know why. And so I don't know. So it's an interesting, um, anyway, it's an interesting issue. I'm not really saying it. So the reason why it's plausible <coughs> is because it does fall out of the no carry situation. But that's not the only case where it'll happen. And there seems to be no reason to believe it will eventually have to stop. Okay? You might be curious if it does. But any questions? Okay? Any other questions about uh, this problem? Okay? Anybody else do it in a clever way? I don't know. It's in a, it's in or an interesting way. way. But I just, uh, my reverse function, make the whole, the long or long, long to be a straight and do swap. Okay, so one possibility that might have been, let's say, the you know another way to do it would be to take the integer and you somehow blow the integer up into digits explicitly. Okay, now you've got a digit string, and then testing if it's a palindrome or not is a um, you know what you call it is a string operation. Okay, reversing a string would on one sense require a little bit less cleverness than reversing a digit sequence, okay? Here this, sh this right shifting is a little bit clever. On the other hand, I don't see an advantage to that, okay? This, this one I like better than, than going to the string. But how many lines long was yours? 20 something. Okay, so that might be an advantage. Why was yours 20 something? So let's think what you did. You took the number and you blew it into a string. For that, you presumably had this loop where you were doing mod 10 and then div 10, right? I call the string stream cast and it's just a, a few lines of code. Ah, what you're saying is you did something a little more clever than that. You're saying C as a way to print out integers. There's a built-in library in your thing to convert an integer to a string. Is that right? And once you have that, then actually this makes sense to me. Now you've got, you, you, you can find a way to take this to the integer, convert it to a string instantly. Okay, what's the command for doing that? Uh, uh, you make a string stream and uh, input a uh, long or long or long long into it and call string stream dot str function and you will have the string. And you make a uh, second, uh, if, uh, after finish the swapping, you make a second string stream, call the constructor, and put the string in the constructor, and you can output it to another long uh, uh, integer or long or long long, and it just returns. It's just a few lines of code. Okay, so the interesting thing is about the way you're doing it. You took the math completely out of it. Yeah. Okay, there was no math cleverness at all in what you're doing. But it was interesting. So that is actually an interesting way to do it. How many people understand what he did? Uh, I, okay, and how he converted it to a string. Okay, so that is clever. I'll say that's clever. You know, I, I cringe a little bit, but it's cle it's clever. Okay. Any questions? Anybody else do this in an interesting way? Okay. And I guess the key thing was to read this number and then realize you didn't have to go to a high precision, uh, uh, you know, uh, addition. Did anybody else, you did digit by digit addition, right? Anybody else do digit by digit addition? You did, okay, how long was your solution? 40. 40, okay. So, now why was digit by digit addition so, just doing long digit addition? Again, I had in my, my library for doing long, uh, high precision arithmetic that I talked about last class. It seems pretty complicated. Why is this easier? First, I guess every number was always positive, right? So all that you were really doing then was you, you took it, you exploded the thing into a, uh, an array of digits. Is that basically right? You then went from right to left. And because you knew you were only adding two digits, they were always going to be positive. It was just a question of reading, going four I goes from the right to the left. Keep adding and ripple the carrot. And so that might not be so complicated either. Although the interesting thing is we didn't need to do it that way. Any questions? Anybody come in with a very long solution that they'd like to confess to? 
Okay, a, a solution took more than 50 lines. Okay, okay, good. So that I, that I like that one, and we'll see. Um, any questions? Let's go back. Okay, the next one is archaeologist's dilemma. How many people got this one? Okay, who, who got this one? Okay, somebody who got it, tell me about what the problem's about. Yes. Okay, somebody who remembers what the problem is, who did it and actually remembers what it was. I assume that meant you did it a while ago, is that right? Or? Yeah. Okay. Many years ago. Okay, if you did it many years ago, you don't have to remember it. But someone, anyone who's done it recently? Okay, if no one's done it recently, then maybe we should think about it again. Okay, who's tried this problem? Anybody try this problem? You tried it. Okay, tell me about the problem. Right. And so the question is here, you're given like a power, you have a power of two, like what is it? Uh, 16,384. But the claim was that, uh, that more than half the digits, if I'm correct, have been erased. Is that right? Yeah. And you want to come from this and figure out what's the smallest power of two where this is going to this is going to be it, which in this case is what? Uh, is it Sixteen. Is that it? Okay. A thousand is ten. Is, uh, Fourteen. Fourteen. What? What? Fifteen. Fifteen. Uh, no. Fourteen. Fourteen. So the answer to this one would be fourteen. Does everybody see that? Okay. How do we do this one? How many people have tried this one? Okay, recently. Okay, how many people haven't gotten it working who tried it? Okay, wait, who, who did not get it working? Oh, so you did not get it working. You did not get it working. Okay, good, okay, good. So let's say, what did you try? Brute force. Brute force. So what would brute force for this problem be? I tried uh, to, to I try, uh, yeah. until 50,000. Try all E's up to 50,000, okay? And why 50,000? Because I think that will be sufficient, but actually it's not. Okay, so you said what you were going to do is you compute 2 to the I as I goes from 1 to 50,000, okay? And then do some matching. Now, how did you compute 2 to the I for this large amount? Just adding the 2 to the two to power of one together. I see. So you didn't do it by implementing multiplication. Yeah. You did it by implementing the long precision addition, which we just decided if everything's positive is not that complicated, <coughs> right? Okay. So that's interesting. How long did it take to do this up to 50,000? You mean the, the time? Yes. I think maybe around two seconds. Okay. So 50,000 seems to have the property that it's large, but still doable. Okay, but you probably couldn't go too far beyond 50,000. Okay, how much memory does that take, actually? Let's think about it. Uh, I think how big is 2 to the 50,000 in digits? Uh, less than 50,000. Less than 50,000 is right. Okay, how, much, how big is 2 to the 50,000 uh, in digits? I guess uh, 50,000. Okay, it's approximately 15,000 digits. Why do we come up with this? Wait, this is 50,000. The important thing is that 2 to the 50,000 is the same as 2 to the 3 to the 50,000 over 3. Isn't that right? And 2 to the 3 is 8. 8 is about 10. Is that right? <coughs> So that's why it would come out to be approximately 50,000 over 3, which we've decided is about 15,000. Is that right? I can calculate it that way. I, because uh, I can calculate the digit uh, exactly by uh, 50,000 times log 2 10. And I remember log 2 10 is about uh, 0 0.3. Right, okay. <laughs> Log 2 to 10 is about what? Is it 0 0.3? You mean, wait, no. Uh, 
the cell point three o something. Log two ten is three o. Right. So you're saying here I had three. This is basically saying that log base two of eight is three. You're saying to do it right, I really should want to know what is the log base two of ten, and that you're saying is three point three or something like that, right? And so if we divide it by 3.3, we'll get a, a better answer than this, okay? But it will still come out to be about 15,000, okay? So that gives us a ballpark figure. So we could do it your way. Now, the one problem that we have with this problem seems to be that, that, that there's no guarantee that 50,000 is, is the limit. It's not, it's actually, it's can only compute about 10, uh, 50, five digits, around five digits of the end. But what did it actually say? Wait, let's just go back to this one more time. Wait, you said complete only five digits. What do you mean? I mean, did you do this as a as a, an infinite precision, as a log precision integer, or did you do this as a I mean, I mean, one? that's when n is larger than five digits, then this will not work because. I see. Okay. So it says the trouble here is that n. Wait, wait, hold on. N is. N is ten digits actually, but it can only. Okay, is n here the number that's being input? No, each integer n contains a n that is not bigger than this. Yes. yes. That's the input digit. That's the prefix, right? But this is still um, one, two, three, ten four, digits. five. Ten digits. What? Ten digits. So the question here is. You want to hope that all of the, whatever they give you, they're giving you as input a string of at most 10 digits. Your hope was that one of the first 50,000 powers of two had this 10 digit string as its prefix. Is that right? Okay. That's what you were hoping. Yeah, but it doesn't work. But it doesn't work, okay? That it seems like you might need a higher power to it. Anybody else try something different? Okay, so wait, now what you're trying to do is you're trying to now avoid brute force, is this correct? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I don't uh, implement, use the implementation in uh, high precision. You're not going to use high precision arithmetic. Yeah. Because what you're saying is that there is a slicker way to do this <coughs> than actually do it by the brute force. Yes. Okay? Any other ideas? I mean, I, that's probably the kind of idea that we want here. I just want to see if anybody else tried anything different before we get into this kind of approach. Now let's think about it. How might we avoid, that's really right now the question, is do we actually need um, to use the high precision arithmetic? Okay, the one tip off I hear, that see here, that says you might not, is that the prefix well, I guess, I guess this just means you can read the prefix integer as an integer. That's really what they're saying, basically. Right? So that's interesting. Okay, so how do, we, how do we do it? How do we avoid actually computing all of these things? What's your idea? Uh, use log to calculate. Can I write on the board? Yes, go write on the board. Uh, Let's suppose the answer is uh, how to say this. Two to the x, two to the epsilon. Two to the epsilon. Epsilon. Two to the e. But what, two raised to the e? Two, oh, two raised to the e. Oh, yeah. Okay. And you want a better marker? Right. Like red. Yeah. Different one. Okay. Suppose this is the answer, uh, and it has, it has. Uh, uh, K digits, K digits, uh, uh, after N, after N. For example, okay. uh, if the answer is uh, this number and the N is 10 and the K is equal to 2 because there are two digits after N. Okay. So uh, we can see that N, uh, 
two ways to eat is uh, at least uh, n, n times 10 raised to k and it's smaller <coughs> than n plus 1 10 raised to k. Okay, so let's, let, let's think about this. Okay, so I'm slow with inequality. This one to me is obvious, okay? Why is this? He's saying that because we know that the number starts with this prefix of 10. The 10 here corresponds to that, right? Um, actually, no. The 10 here corresponds to the two digits. Wait, no. Wait, no. Hold, wait, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. 10 to the K corresponds to the, um, basically the number that would be formed by having 1 followed by all of those digits being 0, right? And so here, n is 10 also. That's sort of potentially a little confusing, right? But he's saying that it's got to be equal to, okay, this number has got to be less than this because it starts with the prefix of n, right? So that I understand. Now what about the other side? The other side uh, is filling the, is similar to filling the uh, last k digits with 9. And it, its number is only this this number plus one, because we can see that uh, two raised to e is must must be uh, at most this number, at most this number, okay. and the plus one is equal to this number, so it must be smaller than this number. I see. So this says that knowing that there is. I see. Knowing that, that if we know that in fact it's going to have k digits that we don't see, yeah. okay, then in fact the value has to be between this and this because this is the maximum amount. Yeah, maximum amount, and this is the minimum. Right. Right. Is this the right bound though, or would it be? Uh, this is the right bound. Right. Okay. And I use uh, Bruce force from one from one to maybe a very large number. Right. And and from k to from one maybe not one maybe two from two to uh, maybe very large I just try it. and and then I I can calculate if there exit an integer e uh, satisfies by this equation. Okay, so let's think now what we're doing. So I kind of get the idea that he's saying that that if if there is a solution, yes. okay, it satisfies these bounds, okay. Now then, how do you test though that it does satisfy these bounds? Uh, it's quite easy because uh, from this from this we can see that. I use log, 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 two, and this is e. And this number is equal to uh, log, log, two, and plus k, log, two, k. Right? So this we can see in the same way is smaller than and we also use log. Right.
to give a that for a given k, it will give you a bound on an e, right? And for a given k, it will give you a bound on e. And your assertion is that the first value of k, where this equals this, what? Uh, the first k, uh, when there is a solution in this, uh, in this iteration, in the equation, then k is the answer. Okay. E is the answer. Uh, e, uh, yes. Yes. The, because we can see that as k raised, e also uh, raised. Right. So uh, when k is the smallest solution, e also the smallest answer. Okay, so let's go through this one more time. How many people understand this? Okay? How many people don't understand it? Raise your hand. Okay? How many people didn't raise their hands? <laughs> okay? Let's go through this one more time, because this is obviously a little bit clever. Now, it depends upon one numerically potentially unstable thing. Yes, I know. Okay? And, but, but on the other hand, obviously this is very clever. Okay? So what is the idea, like one more time? We're saying that the property that, um, that, that two to the e is going to lead with a prefix of that means that 2 to the e is going to fall between these two ranges. Because this is the range of the numbers with that prefix. Okay? Basically, that's right. Okay? And so you want to find what is the smallest e with this property. Okay? Now, we know that k has to start out basically being at least the number of digits. There's one constraint here, right? That they say that k can't be you have to have more washed out digits than shown digits, right? Okay, so you start your search for k, okay? Or equivalently, your search for e. Which did you look for? Did you look for k or did you look, I look for e? Look for k. Okay. okay? And for a given value of k, you would compute this, and you would compute this. Yes. And if, in fact, they were the same, that was, I guess, what you needed, right? Yeah. Okay? If the, the, the bounds here were the same, that meant that it was less than this and greater than or equal to that. That meant that you had the right value of k. From k now, you can convert to what the corresponding e is using your expression, using either one of these, basically, right? And that would do it, okay? I now believe that solution now. Any questions about that? Yes. Uh, I think there's, we can do this in a constant time, no constant time. Okay. We do not to need to search for all of them. Okay, how do you do it in constant time? I can't write it. I, I think this should work. Uh, of course, we want to, we want, we want this to have an individual value. Okay. Okay, I see. So what you're trying to say is, okay, so what you're saying here is that you're saying that you know that E, if you're looking for the K with the property, that it's basically log N plus 1 plus K log 2 10 is equal to log of N basically plus k log n. Is that right? This is what you're seeking, is the k where this is equal. Right? That's really the big the big picture question you're asking for. Right? I, I can't see the rules. You can't read the writing? Okay. What I think what you're saying is, what we are seeking as the answer to this, is the solution to the equation. k log, um, k log base 2 of 10. Okay. Wait. No. Uh, okay. K log ten base two of ten plus K 
k log base 2 of n plus 1 is equal to, okay, that's this side, is equal to k log um, 2 of 10 plus log 2 of n. Uh, that's the no, no, I, I mean this, uh, because this is some digits. Like x point something, and this should be. Wait, no, what is the, let's look at what the inequality is that we're looking for. No, no, you, you, you can, you, uh, they are always not equal. Okay. I think but this, I want to find this yeah, is x one is something. Uh, if they are x minus one. Okay, right, so you want to say that the ceiling of one is equal to the floor of the other, right? It's a question of, which is the bigger one? So I think what you want to say is that the floor of this one equals the ceiling of that? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. OK. Now the question is, can we fact, now you want to try to figure out what k is. This log n and this log n, n is fixed, right? Uh, there's no k there. There's no k here, and there's no k. OK, fine. Agreed. Now this is going to be a constant. Right? This is going to be a constant. This is going to be a constant. And this is going to be a constant. Is that right? So you've got a question of really what you're trying to solve ultimately is an equation of the form. Basically, C1K plus C2 floor of it is equal to the ceiling of C3 K, actually it's the same, same C1, K plus C3. Does everybody agree with that? Okay, and now how do you propose to solve that quicker? Okay, you would like to somehow factor out something from this. Okay? But I don't offhand see how you, where, where you can solve this now. Okay? Does anyone see how you can solve this in constant time? Okay? Now I'm wondering if, let's think if there's anything like this. Okay? And now here you're saying you're going to iterate through all k. Okay? And the difference is now, <coughs> You had gotten stuck originally on 50,000. There's no problem at all running this for 50,000, right? The way it would have been is you're not running 15,000 digit integers now, right? Now you can iterate this to a much higher power. Does everybody agree with that? And that's what seems to me like that might suffice. Okay? Any questions about it? And then I think there always exists that K for any, any yes. other. The claim here is that there will always exist a K for this. Now, can anybody prove that? Okay, let's think about it. Why is that obvious? Okay. But how about as if you say that we can give you a good no tower to it, there's no solution? I think that's a confusing <laughs> That might be a way to confuse you. Is there a limit on, let's say, how big an integer you need to test? No. So. Okay. So I see no test here. So what possibility is you keep iterating through this until you get tired, and then you would say nothing can be found. That would be one way of dealing with it. Okay. Now the argument is that we will hopefully always find the solution before we get tired, right? If it's always true, is it clear that there's always a solution to this? Okay? Let's think about that. Is there any possible way that there's always a solution to this? Okay? I think the difference between log 2n and log 2n plus 1 is smaller than 1. Okay? Let's see. Well, the interesting thing has nothing to do with logs anymore, does it? Right? Log two ten is uh, is 
the erasure number. Erasure node number. Log 2 of n is an irrational number. That's sort of, that I believe is true. So what does that mean? And the log 2n and log, the difference between log 2n and log 2n plus 1 is smaller than when. So, which means I can plus something to make this one is smaller than this uh, integer and one is larger than the integer. Just want to find the fraction. Uh, okay. And because the difference between log n plus 1 minus log 2 n is smaller than 1. Yes. But you cannot say that it's smaller than uh, log 2 n. What? That, that's that's what? You can prove that. What? It definitely can run across. What do you mean? You're saying that, what you're saying is that, that, that this number will um, differ. Um, okay, it's certainly not true that this is always going to be this value you say is always going to be less than 1. The difference between them is going to be less than 1. That I do believe. But I don't see quite what that may, means for me. It means that if I add some fraction f to it, well, make, make, uh, definitely make an integer between them. For some fraction f. I mean, You're saying that there is some point at which this is going to double, that this is going to differ. Wait. As n gets larger, the difference between these two is going to keep getting smaller and smaller. As n gets larger, yes. right? Okay. So there exists an S from some uh, from an interval such that the sitting finds this equal to zero. Exists in that at least a small number. Because this this two are not equal, so I can definitely find an S. Okay, so your claim is that this is going to happen whenever we roll over, the log rolls over a digit. And then it's this and that, such that this number plus F. Okay, I'm not sure I'm seeing that, but that may be me being weak. Um, okay, what I'm thinking about here is, in general, does this always have a solution? No. Let's think about that. No. Well, let's think about that and see if that may be true, okay? First thing to note here is that I guess for all these constants, we can assume that C2 and C3 are... I think I can count it down as this one is zero. And this is also zero. This is one. Not for any integer. Wait a second. Let's think about that. Because for any k, this is equal to I see. That's interesting. Okay, let's say that's good. Okay? Agree. Okay? Okay? So you're not going to look at the general version. You're going to say that the only two active elements in here. Okay, right there, go ahead and do it.
I don't really doubt that there is such an f. But now my question is, can it be realized by k a multiple? Is there an f? The question is, is there an f that is a, it's k log it's, uh, two? No, for, for, it's, it's not necessarily. It's just want to find some k, k log two a. of it, <clears throat> we're basically going to keep doing this until we hit, uh, either get tired, in which case we would admit this. You're saying is we should never get tired, okay? And, um, and I now think I believe this, okay? Any questions here? Okay? So I think I understand now how to do this problem, and there's an elegant way to do it. And the only thing that you're relying on that is sort of a little fishy is that you're relying on the precision of these log functions being implemented well enough numerically that you're not going to run into trouble. But I think I agree with you that that's a good gamble to take. Uh, I think uh, it's not a big deal, bigger matter, because you can see that uh, because the left bar it, it assumes the, the digit is already zero. zero. Yes? Right? Yeah. And the, on the right side, uh, it is also assumed it's also the zero. All, all, the, all of them the zero. And the uh, two raised to e, the uh, at least the last the first digit mustn't be zero. Okay. So I think it it won't I think this number won't close to the left side and the right side. So I don't think that is a bit of a matter. Okay, I think I believe that. Okay, any questions? Okay. This is good. Okay, so that's the second one that's done. Somewhat clever. Any questions? Let's go back. Oh, where do we go? Pull oh, back. What about ones now? Ones is a pro who, who's who's done ones? Okay, why don't you give it? Tell me what the problem is. That basically, I think what you're trying to say is that you're given an integer x, you've got an integer, you want to find the integer, the smallest integer y with the property that x times y is going to be the sum, actually, as i goes from 1, 0 to <coughs> k of 10 to the k, 10 to the i, uh, I think this is what we wanted to say. Is this right? That basically, this is a way of writing the number that's all going to be in ones. That's going to consist of k ones. And you want to find what is the value k such that there exists a y that minimizes that, right? How do you do it? Okay? Who here tried brute force? Okay? What is brute force? Try from 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and, and until you find it. So what you did was you tried not you tried different values of k. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, you could have tried different values of y, but that would have been bad. Okay? You tried different values of y this thing. And you then what? You divided it by this? Yeah. And it became a problem in long division. Is that right? Yeah. And you said that if you did this and it divided out properly, then basically if there was Okay, if, if, if you divide it by that, that would be, 
Uh, so you did long integer division? Is that what you did? Um, actually, partially. <coughs> because I only need to add one at every time. Okay. Who here did this by doing long integer division? Long. By long, I mean the big, uh, the kind of stuff that I talked about last class. Is there anybody who tried to do it that way? That would have been excessive work. Now, what's a clever, so we could have, what you're trying to say is that the really brute force way to do it would be to take, construct this number, explicitly divide it by this, and then see if the, the remainder was zero, basically, right? Yeah. Okay? Now, that would have required the law, the, the high precision arithmetic, like we, the, the arbitrary precision arithmetic that we talked about last time. Actually, no need, because... How do we avoid it? I just add one digit by time because it's always, always one and have a uh, and have an integer to get the remainder from the last position. Okay, so you're now going to say instead of keeping track of the whole of the thing here, what you're going to do is you're going to keep track of a window. Let's say you you computed what the remainder. Let's say we know the remainder. Let's say uh, okay. We know that this thing has to have at least as many digits as, let's say our number is 15. Actually, it's 15, but it's divisible by 5, so that's not going to work. Let's say 17 was the input, right? We know that k had to be equal to at least 3, because or else it wouldn't be bigger than it, right? And it couldn't divide it. Now what did you do? You computed the remainder of 17 mod 10, mod 1 10? Write it out. Uh, it's simple. I just write it from one one and then I cannot find out. So, oh, it's just one one and seven eight. And there's nothing, so I get zero. And from this, I get 70 remain. And then one here. I'm trying to just do this. I get another remain. And this and one of each of the It's one, one, one. I see. So what you're doing is you're implementing long arithmetic, but you haven't completely specified this number. That's the actual way to think about it, right? You're doing long division, but spe not specifying, but, but not specifying the function. You're going to keep doing it until the residue that's left here is zero. Yeah. Okay? Does everybody see that? So what exactly does that mean, taken from our vision of arithmetic? You were going to be computing, find out what was the multiple of 7, you were going to keep subtracting out basically 17, 17, 17, until it got smaller than, until it was, was smaller than, uh, so you basically took out, so this number, right, you took this number x, and you took its, its remainder mod 17. Is that right? Its remainder when you divided it by 17. That's what's going to be the next value down here. And to that, you then multiplied it by 10 to shift it over yeah, and added 1 to it. Does everybody see that? And then you kept doing that kind of an iteration until that remainder turned out to be 0. Does everybody see that? So that's clever. He's really doing long division, okay? But he's only doing, but he's, but he's avoiding doing it repeatedly by sometimes building the number as he goes along, okay? Any questions about that? Any comments? Any other ideas on this one? I think the answer must be smaller and most the answer. Your claim is that the answer to this has to be at most n, okay? What does that mean? Um, uh, we can see that, um, I want to, uh, let, let me define a Wait, number. n is the, let's say the n is here, right? That's the 17 yeah. part, this yeah. is n. You're claiming that the answer to the number of digits yes. has to be at most n. Yes. Okay, why is that? Uh, because we can see that, uh, uh, I, I suppose f, uh, fk is equal to uh, uh, the 
the number with k k digits, uh, uh, all of them are one and mark n, and mark n. Uh, and then we can see that f i is determined by f i minus. I can write this out. I can't. I can't do that many symbols in my head. I, I think it's. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. I uh. I define F I is equal to C. Right, but one interesting thing when you do this, one question is, is there going to be an answer? Okay, is there an upper bound? Okay. Well, I mean, the current, the specification says you're always going to find an answer. It's like, it doesn't give you an option to not mean an answer. I can prove that this is the answer. So it says there's always going to be an answer. Okay, so one possibility for the purpose of the program is to say, to damn it, there's going to be an answer. And yes. ignore it. Yeah, now what he's trying to do is, is educate us, which is interesting. <laughs> In why is there always an answer? Okay? Oh. And I think that's interesting. So yeah, let's yeah, go yeah. Okay, I think uh, he has proven because uh, when there is, uh, no, no, sorry, uh, K digits. Okay. Right. Okay, and we can uh, do a dynamic program. Okay? 
So this would argue that one way to test is that if they gave you an integer, okay, I guess if it was divisible by two or five, you would give up, right? And otherwise, you could uh, do that one, okay? Any questions? So we agree that the pigeonhole argument means that either it goes in an infinite loop or it, you have found it. And one way or another, you've resolved the question. Any questions? Yes? Um, I think because uh, we have the 9 multiplied 9 form, and you can see that uh, uh, the 3, 7, 9 has a 1 to 1 function to the last digits. I mean, OK. So there must exist that answer. solve this problem. And there was a time limit of how much many seconds on this? 10 seconds. How would you solve this problem? Okay? This is a dirty trick that sometimes people use. Okay? Suppose that this problem, the fastest algorithm you could think of would take two minutes to run. Okay? And they give you a time limit of 10 seconds. How could you solve this problem in 10 seconds? What? Build a table, okay? This is one that's interesting because it's a finite-sized problem. Why is it a finite-sized problem? They'll tell you n is between 0 and 10,000. Does everybody agree with that? So if you had a program to do it and it wasn't quite fast enough, one dirty thing that you could do is compute it on a slower thing and then write your program that does an if statement to basically do the test. Does everybody see that? Okay, so some people do submit through this kind of thing, and I think it's a fair solution. I will admit that M Miguel, who runs the judge, sometimes kicks programs out for being too fast. <laughs> and if a program is too fast for something, he'll reject it, because they're probably doing something like this. Okay, any questions? But that's a reasonable solution. Any questions? So that one's done. Let's look at the last one, which I think is kind of an interesting one also, on multiplication game. How many people looked at the multiplication game problem? Okay, how many people have got it working? Okay, how many people don't have it working and tried it? Okay, someone, who, someone <coughs> tell me about the problem. <coughs> someone who did it who hasn't spoken yet, tell me about the problem. Okay, someone from that side of the room. Yes? Um, uh, you have uh, integer input and uh, two person do multiplication uh, one by one and until uh, one of them get the uh, multiplication and the result which is larger than the input and he wins the game. Okay, so there is a target here that is input, I guess there's a target number that's input, is that right? 
This is the barrier. This is our, our target. And we're starting out with one. And then players alternate. I guess it's Stan Ali, Stan Ali, Stan Ali, right? And they can multiply by a number two to nine, an integer from two to nine. And the goal is to be the one that drives it over. Is that right? So if Ali can have a number multiply it by something to drive it over, that then Ali wins. Is that right? The goal is to be the one that drives it over. Am I right about that? Or is it the one to have the other guy drive it over? Okay? The drive over wins. Okay? And the question now is, they give you a number. This target is up to about 2 to the, th what is it, 2 to the 32? Is that what this is? Okay. Fair enough. So how do we go about doing it? How do we figure out, uh, is it a question of who wins if everybody plays carefully? Okay. How do we do this? Somebody else who doesn't talk so much. Okay, I like you talking, but I like to spread the spread it around the room. <coughs> Any ideas as to how we can do this one? Okay. Is there any case that becomes simple? Okay. The way I would think about this one is here again, we want to know who wins. Okay. Actually, is this also a finite size problem? This is a finite size problem. So why don't we build a solution table for all of them? Okay? What's the problem? The number is too large. Too large, okay? But does everybody agree that this is a finite size problem in conceptually? Okay? Now how do we solve it for a particular in that each target either Stan wins or Ollie wins, right? Now how do we figure it out for a given target? Any ideas? Okay. And so, uh, <coughs> uh, every choke is like the same wings, and then I choke out all of the So, what are the numbers here? What numbers, if Ali is going to have the last, let's say, what numbers does the, the last, I guess, Let's think about it. For what numbers are one solution away from being, one step from being one? Okay? Seems to me that any number, this is the target. There's a set of some numbers that can be solved that they can be one in one move. Right? Which are those ones? Okay, which numbers can be one in one move? Okay, for a given target, if the target is T, which ones can be one in one move? I think any number greater than or equal to T over nine can be one in one move. Does everybody agree with that? So, if you are, if the number is that value, and it's your move, okay, you are going to win, right? What if it, though, is not your number to win, okay? You'd very much like it to be the case that you do not take your number and multiply it by something that puts it in that range, because then the next guy can win. Is that right? Okay. So how do we break this thing into sort of discrete ranges to determine who wins or loses? Okay. You're saying that the numbers up to here, if we go an additional at t over 9 over 2, which I believe is t over 18, right? Uh, not exactly because because you have some, because you mean not exactly T over 9, so exactly integer, and we get some part of Okay, so let's, okay, let's just look at the basic idea here. T over 9 over 2, okay? 
The property in here is that I have to multiply it by at least 2, which would bring it into this range, right? But, um, but if I, I can't multiply it by enough to get it out of here. Does everybody agree? So here the guy is a winner. Here the guy is a loser. Does everybody agree with that if you get that number? Can you work further back? Okay, and for every number, identify whether or not the person who gets it is a winner or a loser. Okay? How long is the longest game that can be played, by the way? Okay, what's the largest game that can be played? How many moves can it take? At most. Yes, at most. At most, log two. Every game, I think every move is at least two, right? So the longest game would be everybody plays two. So every game is going to be at most 32 moves long, is what it seems to me. Okay? And we can break it up into ranges where somebody wins and loses. Okay? Does everybody agree with that? Is that enough detail? Are we ready to go home at this point? Or do we need that to go back and figure out, and you're all ready to go home, you look at the clock. But from when we look at the problem now, is it now completely done? I don't think it's quite yet done. How do we go back and recur back to the beginning? Keep doing this from here over 9, don't you? Let the number divided by 9 all schools equal 23. Okay, so what you're proposing is, you think that in fact we could divide it by at each round the spacing is going to be given either by dividing it by 2 or by 9. You think what you could do then is to basically go through and walk through all the divisions of numbers build essentially an array of bounds okay showing the classification of each number okay and um, then just do a test for the new number. Does it fall into a number that has an even number of things, steps, or an odd number of steps to finish? Actually, we don't not need to do that. Okay, how do you do? Propose just to do. Just keep doing T O nine O two, and do not need to restore. Uh, to need to remember the. the so you're saying don't remember the whole track. What you're saying is at this point. Um, the person who's got these numbers are losers. Actually, and the winner should be figure out how to make the one, uh, how to make it over T O and I over two, so that I have make the winner number from T to T right. over nine over two. Okay. So now what you're saying is, um, wait, okay. Wait, say this again now. Go write it down.
Okay? I just want to... Your target is, your new target is going to be what? You divide by the over 9? Over 2. The over 9 over 2, which means this. Yeah, and uh, I reduce the problem from, I want the 1 for over 2 ways to the problem that the 1 for the over 9 over 2 ways. So I see. You're saying if I get you, well, no. Because if, 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 if I get you. Because I, if I get you from here to here, then, then you can wait from here to here. Because uh, here I have a winner, right? Right. And the winner gets over here, and the winner also gets over here. So this is the problem. See, I'm not convinced that it's a question of can I get just over this barrier. Because if I get too far over this barrier, the other guy would win. This is the winner win. Because it's the winner move. Right? So the winner can, can control this too. This right. Because this is the winner. It's from two to one. Okay? Okay. It may be that I'm just foggy, but I'm not exactly seeing the details here. What is the interesting idea? Does anybody have a better explanation of that? Or am I being crazy? Okay, exactly how you end it. Okay, okay. Okay, go ahead and try it now. One more time. Like I have a, like I am a winner. Yeah. So I want to make sure that the last thing uh, the loser is located in this Yeah. Right? So I want to make sure the loser is here. Yeah. Now I agree. Okay. So uh, here I'm also a winner. Mm -hmm. Right? I am winner if what? If it is in the TOO2, uh, like this T prime, and this is the prime of the number. And this from the So here I have the. Right. And uh, this part is also the winner. Your claim, though, the difference is you change the recurrence situation. Before we just had to get beyond it. Now you're saying we I have to put you into this bucket. Okay. Oh, this length is equal to Tn over nine. This is because this is uh, over nine and this is over nine over two. This net is equal to this net. So the winner multiplied by two located from this. Okay. You're saying because this winter window is twice that. Okay. Yeah, so you can make some modifications to make the number of this location. Okay, so I agree with that. But why if I'm a little bit further beyond here, why can't I also make something? By multiplying it by three to put you in. No, because, because this this region is T prime over nine to T prime. If you make the scale to be local, you can see it. Okay. Yeah, because this is T prime over this is T prime over T prime over line. And this is this is once we understand it right. It's a good example of something called a mini-max kind of a strategy. Okay, where what's good for me is only if I can figure out ahead of you. How many people here know how computer chess programs work? Chess, chess programs. Has anybody ever looked at, let's say, like, how many people know about uh, mini-max strategies? How many people have never heard of them? Mini-max. Mini-max. Meaning mini max. Okay. So okay. So how is it that chess programs or tic-tac-toe programs or any kind of search-based algorithm work? 
When I make a move, the assumption is that I am going to be making the best move for me. If all the moves are bad but one of them is good, then I have a good move. If the opponent is trying to pick the moves that are good for them, meaning loses for me, right? So what I, my goal here is, I'm going to try to pick the maximum solution out of all the solutions which would, where, where I'd be getting the minimum, the value of the node is the minimum of the possible things below it, okay? Because I am trying to win, they are trying to make me lose, okay? And so you get the same kind of a structure here in this kind of game as in any kind of a two-player game, okay? And similar, let's say, recursive algorithms, more general than this particular case. Necessary to deal with that. Any questions? Beat on these, and, ne and uh, next lesson I think we talk about combinatorics. Okay, thanks for your attention. See you guys next class.